now, uh, just so that people can view this afterwards on YouTube as well. Uh, but if you're uncomfortable with that, please email us to let us know. Uh, Teresa, Stacy, and I uh, are Green Party volunteers. Uh, we have uh, staff and candidates haven't been uh, uh, participating in uh, preparing the questions, uh, but we've just been doing this to strengthen the Green Party. And uh, we'll also post some information about the upcoming Q and A's and the debate that's scheduled for September 23rd. We'll post that in the chat. Uh, and with that, I want to hand over the microphone to Mike Morris, the candidate in the 2019 election here. Thanks so much, Matt, and uh, wonderful to see you all again with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Howard, a particular thanks to you for making time to be with us. This is, uh, we've been doing this since early to mid-August, and I've been saying each week as the, as we move well, on, just more time becomes more, more in, uh, de in demand. Campaign. Uh, what I turn the video is the audio better now. Um, my internet seems to be pretty horrible right now. I've just uh, tethered to my cell phone, so we'll see how it goes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine, Doctor Howard. I, think I can. Good. It's on my side. I think it's mine. Is, oh, really? How is it now? Is um, you guys can hear me better? Yeah, I can hear you good now. I'll be. Okay, I'll be brief then. <laughs> Dr. Howard, welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, those of you with us probably already know, but Dr. Howard is an emergency room physician, uh, first female board chair of the uh, Canadian Association of Physicians for the, en for the Environment, uh, uh, lives in uh, Yellowknife with her uh, uh, family, and I, we all feel, and certainly I feel, it's just a wonderful addition uh, to the uh, leadership race uh, with a real focus on plant planetary health. And uh, so with that, Dr. Howard, again, thanks so much for being with us and uh, I'll pass it over, over to you. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, it's really lovely to see everybody. And I really appreciate the time and energy that goes into organizing these. You guys are really kind of keeping the flames burning in between elections and that's incredibly important for movement building. So I'm uh, Courtney Howard. I'm here in Yellow Knives Dene territory. So this is Chief Dragi's territory, uh, traditional lands also of the North Slave Métis. And I've lived here for about nine years. My parents actually met here and um, set up shop as newlyweds in a shack a little ways down the shoreline here on Great Slave Lake. Um, I actually took the last call in a little wander around Old Town. So um, Put up your hand if, if you'd like me to do that. <laughs> I, I, I could try that here. I see that, uh, yeah, there's, um, yeah, the internet. Hey, internet. Uh, apparently, the urban rural divide has actually gotten worse over the course of uh, COVID. And so I think COVID has really shown us what's possible in rural and remote locations, but also shown us that we're not quite there yet in terms of the tools we need to really do a great job. Uh, so I ended up growing up as the child of two teachers down in North Vancouver. I did a lot of competitive gymnastics and uh, dancing growing up was sort of your typical, um, you know, straight A student, did everything right, good little girl, uh, went to university and uh, ended up in med school. And then my mom got really sick. So she was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma at age 55, uh, you know, no risk factors for anything and was given about a 5% chance of living uh, five years. And she went through non, you know, an autologous, autologous bone marrow transplant, all sorts of radiation and chemo. And really it was during that process, uh, seeing healthcare from the patient side that I really developed um, a strong desire to be a doctor because we were lucky to have really good care. And I really appreciated what, uh, you know, how much physicians were able to change our lives by mostly by being present with my mom and treating her as though she was somebody still living as opposed to dying from disease. And so that really formed my philosophy of care. And I was lucky to get into med school. I went to med school at UBC and then did family practice in Victoria and then moved to McGill to complete my emergency training and wrote, read a book by uh, Dr. James Urbinski, who remains a hero of mine. 
And it was about uh, Doctors Without Borders. And I ended up really wanting to go work for MSF. And so what they say on their website is, well, if you want to come work for us, you better go get some experience in rural and remote parts of Canada. And so that was why I originally went up to Inuvik. It was as a resident and I yeah, was aiming to get experience and ended up uh, with an entirely new appreciation for the North, for Indigenous communities and culture. And when I went back as a locum, I happened to pick up a book in the Edmonton airport that talked about the oil sands and climate change and essentially had my climate awakening moment in Inuvik, which is uh, three degrees Celsius warmer than it was when an 80 year old elder was born. So that was just after the Lancet had uh, issued a first commission on climate change and health, which said that climate change was the biggest health threat of the 21st century. So. The Lancet is a weekly journal. It's the most prestigious journal in medicine. And the quote that goes on its front cover is often, um, you know, the number one quote of any given week in medicine. And so that, that, that line that climate change is the biggest health threat of the 21st century caused waves. And yet, um, because medical curricula is really, really slow to change due to all sorts of inertia, I was reading this having just finished emergency training, never having thought about climate change as a health issue. And so as an emerge doc, I'm trained to take action uh, in time limited circumstances, which very much includes climate change. And so I essentially set about um, bringing this to the attention of the Canadian medical community. So I was lucky to find the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment really early on and ended up on their board because I just showed up. (laughs) at their board meeting and they could see I was really motivated and so um, have been on their board ever since and have been on their exec for about five years and helped to set up their current chapter structure. Uh, So we now have chapters in BC, Alberta, um, Ontario, Quebec and we're setting up one in the east and I'm proud to say that uh, CAPE is I believe the most high impact small NGO uh, working on the environment in Canada. We get more um, media than even the Pemina Institute who has 10 times as many employees as we do. And that's because health um, is the most resonant frame um, for us to use to talk about climate change. Um, there's been a lot of studies in communication science that have looked at that and it's because it makes it real to people. People understand the impact that a wildfire and asthma smoke has on them and their families and their day much more directly than when we talk about polar bears and when we talk about carbon dioxide levels. And so um, there's a huge um, um, uh, potential, I believe, for the Green Party to go from being really the party of climate change to being the party of planetary health. And I think that that's really the message that will help it sort of say what it's been saying, um, but in a way that meets Canadians where they are as opposed to where we would hope that they would be and particularly at the moment of a pandemic when health is everybody's overriding concern um, really will will speak to people. And so I have been very active at both the national and the international level. I kind of got in on the ground floor when it comes to this this issue. And so I'm the most well-known spokesperson on this topic in Canada um, and and one of the most well-known ones internationally too. So I I'm taking a leave of absence uh, from a role as the advocacy chair for the World Health Organization Civil Society Working Group on Climate Change and Health. We, just prior to my leave of absence, launched a letter calling on G20 leaders to prioritize a low carbon recovery that ended up getting signed by organizations representing two thirds of the global healthcare workforce, so 40 million healthcare practitioners. So we know that healthcare practitioners view the pandemic as a planetary health emergency or it originated at the intersection between animals and humans and is therefore the biggest proof point we've ever had about the the need to take action at this intersection. And so I was here, you know, sitting in my little house in Yellowknife, watching the pandemic unfold, working in the emergency department and became quite concerned that um, climate was gonna end up taking a back seat to pandemic related work. And we know that this is really the last 
good time window that we have to take action on climate change. And so putting it all together is watching the different leadership candidates um, enter the race. And there are great, you know, very, very credible people, very, um, you know, talented individuals. But knowing what I know about um, the evidence around the health frame, the evidence that shows that trusted messengers are really important and doctors usually rank near the, near the top of the list, as well as the um, experience I've had of being from the north, so from a highly impacted area from a climate perspective, I found that that's helped me get things done um, because people, you know, we are at the leading edge of climate change. And so I find people trust what I have to say more. I, I haven't met a climate denier since I moved to Yellowknife. It just, it would be like saying that, you know, the sun's not out when the sun's out. It's, you know, there's trees that are tipping over because the permafrost is melting. It's pretty obvious. Um, and so those stories that you bring to it, um, you know, we know that uh, although those of us who love evidence would love it if our graphs were the things that convince people, that's not what the evidence shows. The communication science tells us that really it's stories that, uh, that move people. And so I've spent a lot of time um, working. I've done research on wildfires. I've done uh, papers on eco-anxiety and ecological grief. I've done a lot of policy work, um, both in Canada on behalf of the Lancet Countdown, and I was their international policy coordinator. So really looking for those sweet spots where we can take evidence and find a policy window and find a story they can really motivate um, populations and policymakers to, to do what's right for health now and for the future. And so I think that, um, you know, even at this point of the race, having gotten to know everybody, I still believe that the, the major opportunity for the Green Party is with the planetary health frame. And I believe I'd be the right messenger, uh, the most effective messenger to carry that for the party as leader. And so that's why I'm running. Um, I live on a permafrost hill and I've got two little kids and it this this matters um i spent six months resuscitating malnourished children in djibouti and had some of them die under my care and malnutrition is the the biggest forecast health risk of climate change in our century so whether it's from a humanitarian perspective whether it's from a doctor of the north perspective whether it's from a parent perspective i believe the greatest health emergency of our time is climate change and now is our best window to take action and they're presenting it as a health in uh as a health issue um, is the best way for us to move forward. So that's that's why I'm running for the leadership of the Green Party, and I'm very happy to uh, take your take your questions and hear what's what's going on in your neck of the woods. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Uh, if I, if I could start, um, there's some uh, interaction already between uh, COVID and uh, and climate change. Uh, people are commuting less, so there's some benefits, but um, people are also noticing uh, uh, so some people are, with, are without work, so they don't have the, the money to spend on initiatives towards sustainability. So there's a bit of, uh, uh, I guess, mixed dynamics of how we might come out of the pandemic uh, uh, with respect to sustainability. Um, what would your strategy be to kind of get us moving in that direction after we come out of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. So we, um, there, there have been some good initiatives and I'll show you one of my little reasons for taking action on climate change right here. This is Vivi. These are some Green Party members. Welcome. You can watch it, the show if you want. Her, her major objective is to catch me in the middle of the call. So she gets a yes to yes, you can watch a show. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with her uh, change making ability or negotiating ability. <laughs> Her timing's become excellent. Um, so, yeah, so I think that the um, opportunity is that it has shown us that we can change very quickly at a societal level for the benefit of health and that when push comes to, comes to shove, we prioritize one another. And so, and we, we listen to experts. And so I think there's a lot of parallels we can draw between what has worked in the coronavirus response in Canada and what can work in climate. Um, in other areas, it's also um, given us a bit of a ability to visualize what a world that is more consistent with a healthy response of climate change would be. And so particularly in places where they have a lot of air pollution as a result of transport, um, or you know, really bad traffic gridlock. It can be difficult, and I think in general the environmental community hasn't done a great job 
um, at painting a vision of where we're going. And so I think uh, some of some of what we've seen has has allowed us to be like, hey, you know, when we do it this way, we can see the mountains. Um, it can feel better to go outside. You can breathe easily, not have an asthma exacerbation. Your kids can play. And we can spend more time with our families if we're staying at home. And so it's given us stories to tell and images to present to motivate people. And I think that that part's really, um, really valuable, particularly maybe internationally. So I don't know if you've seen pictures of Delhi, but you know, incredible difference. And my colleagues internationally are really pointing to that as something that people are talking about. Um, on the other hand, we need to recognize that it is, uh, you know, those are temporary changes. So we need to make systemic changes in order to um, sustain those. And so we need to really make clear, um, the message I've been giving a lot is, now we know the planetary health crisis is horrible. <laughs> and so how about we prevent the next one? And I find that drawing those parallels can help. So when we look at what Canada's done since the beginning of the, the pandemic, we've spent 16 billion additional dollars supporting fossil fuel uh, energy. And only the last time I looked at the, the tracker, 2 billion supporting clean energy. And so we know that um, evidence that, that the influences on our politicians are, are not adequate to this point to have them make the decisions that are consistent with a healthy future. So part of our platform um, actually looks at how we can increase evidence-based influence. Um, as at CAPE, we actually had a document from the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers leaked to us early in the pandemic, and it referenced two previous meetings with federal cabinet. Um, and so, you know, that's a level of access that no environmental NGO that I know of, um, you know, benefits from. And when we looked at um, a report from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, it showed that when they audited uh, visits as per the lobbying register over about six years, um, the fossil fuel industry was getting five times more than environmental NGOs. And so we proposed, um, you know, we can't control anybody's lobbying budget. And I've been on enough boards to know that most small organizations don't have anywhere near the lobbying budget of a fossil fuel company. However, we can um, have an influence over the time allocation of public servants and decision makers. So we have proposed a one-to-one -one ratio for visits from nonprofit and profit seeking actors with our federal decision makers and staff and that that be logged and audited and publicly reported by um, the, the lobbying office. I'm a, I'm a paid lobbyist on behalf of um, the Canadian Medical Association. And so I've been a little bit part of this process. I have to submit a report at the end of every month, um, but really it's not very detailed. Um, and they don't ask for your PowerPoint presentations or any um, documents, any policy briefs you might hand over. So we're also asking that those be um, publicly available instead of something that you need to ask for in an Access to Information Act. And then when we look at um, work that has worked, so our food guide is almost a miracle of public policy. I was very involved in that process um, for CAPE. So I did our submissions to the food guide and to the um, Associated National Food um, Strategy. And they actually did not accept closed door meetings with the industry over the course of the development of that policy. And it was apparently Jane Philpott who just put her elbows up and said, uh-uh, we're not gonna have closed door meetings and held the line despite incredible pressure. And we ended up with a food guide that looks pretty much exactly the same as the Eat Lancet Commission, which, which had a very similar process, same period, time period, I think the exact same number of experts. Um, they launched within about two weeks of one another and look exactly the same. Now, the fact that that happened is almost a miracle. Um, when I sent it to my friend who is a public health practitioner in the US, she said, in my country, ketchup is still a vegetable. And that's what food policy looks like in most countries. So we can see the difference that a policymaker really uh, dedicated to evidence-based influence can make. Um, and so we've suggested that for similar public policy processes, um, a similar um, basically elimination of closed door meetings with the industry most likely to have a conflict of interest with an evidence-based outcome um, be taken. I know that there's initiatives within Health Canada to replicate that process in other um, 
processes there, but you know what a, in our platform we've proposed a um, a climate change uh, climate accountability act similar to the climate change act in the UK that legislates um, every five year carbon budgets as well as created an independent uh, council of advisors to audit the policies to let people know if they're going to actually achieve their carbon budgets or not. So for instance, if we were going to be um, putting that kind of an act together, we would say, nope, you don't get to uh, come in and have a closed door meeting fossil fuel industry because you have a clear conflict of interest. And so those are um, some of the things that I think that we can do because we know what we need to do. You know, the, the action items have been known for a long time, but it's making them happen. That's been the, uh, what's been hampering us. And so we spent quite a bit of time looking at the actual processes and trying to figure out, okay, how can we change the processes so we can achieve the outcomes that we need? Thank you. Uh, there's a few questions uh, lined up. So I'll start with uh, Gordon. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Howard, for taking the time from your busy schedule to be with us. Uh, I, I would like to start by saying I totally agree with what you've been saying about the impact on our health. Um, but my question is going to be in the very specific zone. Um, at, at this point, um, when you look at the seven categories of GHG gas production in Canada, two of those categories account for about 51% of the total. If we can't do anything with those two categories, uh, then we're not going to make progress. And my question will be, after I've just done a quick preamble, about whether you think it would be important to address these two categories, and one of them being the transportation category, the second one, of course, is the oil and gas production category, and the two are rather linked. Um, we have the example already from 2018, where in Winnipeg, uh, the, I guess it's called New Flyer Industries Bus Company started making electric buses because they were able to go into a partnership with the Manitoba government and they could get it going. I guess my question essentially is this, do you think it would be worthwhile at the federal level that we should try to go into partnership with Canadian manufacturers, and that would mean in particular, since there aren't very many of them, Linamar and Magna, and possibly in conjunction with Honda and Toyota, in order to try and get going the manufacture of electric cars and vans in this country. This could be very specific. It would, if we could change the transportation system in this country over say the next 10 to 15 years, and I think it'll take that long, this isn't gonna happen overnight. Uh, but we really need to have the manufacture going on in this country in order to guarantee that we're gonna have the product and that it's going to do what we want it to do. So uh, I guess the question simply is, do you think the Green Party should have as a major campaign objective that we want to do something about the manufacturing of cars and vans? That's a really good question. I'd have to look into it more in order to, um, you know, talk to the companies and find out what the specifics and what they would, um, you know, think would be a reasonable partnership idea, but it's, it's certainly interesting. Um, you know, I live in, as you know, a rural remote area and as a board member for the Canadian Medical Association and also as a, as the president of CAPE, I've spent a lot of time at board tables in Ottawa or Toronto and had to sort of pipe up and say, look, like we've been talking for a whole day and not a single proposal that's been put on the table right now has been something that I could action in my community. And I think that that has really made it tough for the environmental movement and the Green Party to win over rural voters because at the end of the day, if we are making people feel bad for their contribution to climate change and not giving them any off ramps uh, into a new way of doing things. We're painting them into a corner and we should expect exactly what we're getting, which is defensiveness, anger, um, because that's what happens when people feel guilty. Um, that they're, they're understanding some of our message, but if we're not giving people action items, um, I think we're being tremendously unkind. 
And so when I look at, um, and I've spent a lot of time looking at those pie charts myself, um, when I look at the places where we can have a big impact on greenhouse gas emissions and include rural and remote Canada, I think transport is a huge one. Because if we can um, decrease those greenhouse gas emissions, you know, transition to electric uh, vehicles, especially in the provinces that have a mostly clean grid, which are, you know, relatively many, um, that all of a sudden allows people to create a change within their own lives. And, and it's almost as though what I see in my patients sometimes is it's when they know that there is a treatment that they're willing to accept the diagnosis. And I think that that's what we start to do for people in those, those provinces. So yeah, decreasing our transport related um, emissions is actually a really big priority for me. And there's a lot of good health arguments to be made for it. Um, the Lancet countdown policy brief that we put out in, I think it was 2018, uh, quoted stats from 2015 that showed that we have about a thousand transport related air pollution related deaths in Canada and when we asked Health Canada to help us um, put uh, an economic and social and health value on that it was over five billion dollars in that year and so we often don't cost out those externalities and then include them in um, you know as a potential benefit when we're talking about the costs of programs, um, like the rollout of uh, EV charging stations across the country, or like you know potentially helping people on leases, um, which is something else the federal government could do in terms of helping them buy the the um, electric vehicles, I do think we need a um, to take a sort of a, a copy from British Columbia's playbook and make a, a mandate that the sale of all, at least like duty cars in Canada, be um, mandated to be electric by, you know, conservatively we could say 2040, but I think 2030 is a better number. Um, so those we definitely need to do. And I, I would love to, uh, um, be able to put Canadians to work making those um, to, to, to be real, but to sort of, uh, I would need to know more about the specifics of uh, you know, what companies would be looking for from uh, Canada, what the return on investment would like be to Canada for that kind of a partnership, but I think it's a really interesting idea. And actually speaking with farmers, we also need electric tractors and nobody's making them right now. And in fact, that same um, new flyer, it's new flyer. Um, they're in Winnipeg, right? Are they in Winnipeg? Yes. Yeah. And so they were actually proposed to me by um, Darren, um, oh, what's his last name? Quail? Or, no, Darren uh, Qualman, who wrote a paper on um, solving the climate crisis and the farm crisis at the same time. Because I actually own a farm in Manitoba and it's conservative territory. However, um, Chatelaine magazine is on everybody's um, coffee table and they have been doing some of the most incredible articles on climate change over the past couple of, of years. And so I think we need to sort in my head, I picture people in what seem like very conservative parts of Canada actually knowing a lot more about climate change than we can give them credit for. Um, and just kind of be being waiting for us to propose policies that they can actually action and with a narrative that they can tell to their friends and neighbors um, about why they're changing their approach because we need to give them that story to tell to, to, their, to their most trusted and most loved because otherwise they're going to find themselves sort of um, in the out group and that doesn't feel good to anybody. We don't want to put anybody in that position. And so proposals like what you brought forward, I think, are, are really, really interesting. And it'd be uh, great to sit down with some of the leaders of those uh, auto manufacturers and, and see what they say. Thank you for a very positive response. And, and it will be very difficult because the technology is extremely sophisticated. And, um, and that's why I think they would need money. And that's why the idea of a partnership from the federal level to, to get into it and get it kick-started would probably be totally essential. But thank you very much. Yeah, no, I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Um, Mel, you have a question. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, welcome, to, uh, Courtney, or should I say Dr. Howard. Uh, great to have you with us. I, I, I especially appreciated your, in your preamble how you uh, outlined the connectedness of all things and uh, about the importance of messaging, because I think communication is, is going to be one of the big challenges of the Green Party you know, going forward. And it kind of leads into the, my, my next question, which is a question that I've been asking uh, the various different um, uh, leadership candidates, and uh, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Um, you know, in, in order to have greater influence and to advance the various points of the Green Agenda, we're going to need to grow the party. We need to get more Canadians to buy into our agenda and to see us as a real practical alternative and to ultimately elect more Green MPs. So I'm wondering, as Green Party leader, how would you plan to do this? Yeah, good question. And I do think communication is a big part of it. Um, we've been running uh, weekly webinars as part of our campaign. So we're, we're calling them Planetary Health in Action. And we had one of the world's top climate communication scholars on last week. So Ed Maybach, who's someone I've worked with in the past. And he has done a lot of research. And the reason I worked with him in the past and he's done it all for free is because he knows because of the research he's done that presenting climate change in the health frame is the best way to motivate populations to take action that health messengers are the best people to deliver that message. And so I, I think that the health message and the stories that go along with that, whether they're around uh, wildfire evacuations or Lyme disease experiences, what have you, are key. And also painting the picture of the opportunities like what we were just talking about with transport. We can make the world better right now by moving to electric vehicles. And that's just going to mean less kids in the hospital with asthma. Um, when we look, I actually have a case study coming out in the next week or so in the lines of planetary health that talks about how we got the coal power phase out done in Ontario, as well as the commitment to coal power phase out in Alberta and nationally and how Canada helped to found the Powering Pass Coal Alliance, and it has been credited as having been done based on a public health argument with, um, you know, messengers, doctors, nurses um, saying, hey, we need to do this for our kids. And we know that presenting it uh, with a child's health frame is actually additionally motivating. Um, so that's what worked. Um, and Canada is probably one of our proudest moments when it comes to climate change. And that's, that's what all of the, the studies predicted would work. So I say we keep going with what works and just scale it. Um, in terms of um, creating, so I think that will, that will help to bring in the climate strikers, that will help to bring in the families um, we are proposing a really values-based, evidence-oriented approach and really around a healthy future. And, you know, I'm trying very hard to stay away from words like left, right. I don't think people frankly care about those. Um, they never show up on any list of essential needs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like what do people need? They don't need a left leading party. They need food. Right. Um, and so that's what we need to, to be looking at. We need to be talking in the words that people that, that are the same words that people use when they describe what they need. And, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for my colleagues who are proposing eco-socialism, but I don't think anybody has a clue what that means. Um, and I just don't think it's going to be a useful communications device for us. I've had a lot of teaching roles. I was a gymnastics coach. I was a math tutor. I was a chemistry tutor. I, I've spoken at upteen medical conferences. Um, I teach advocacy skills. I teach communication skills. I teach media skills. None of them say make a word that nobody knows the, the, the meaning of and use that to brand your, your political party. And so, yeah, food food, safety, shelter. That's what we need to talk about. Um, and that's important. And then what that will help to do is bring in people who don't see themselves as politicians, uh, don't see themselves as politically active, but can connect with the need for food and for safety. And as long as we then provide a really safe and positive atmosphere within the party so that they feel like we're a place where, you know, there could be a potluck and they could bring their kids and everybody could have a good time. And then we could be together as just a group of humans who are trying to do something good in the world um, and feel safe there, that I believe is what will grow the party. And so we have some work to do to, to get there. We've heard from um, some youth people uh, on our webinars that they didn't feel safe in some of the um, 
uh, work that they did on campaigns in the 2019 election. I think there's a lot, there's sort of an awareness within the party that it needs to diversify. So to bring more young people in, to bring people um, of different colors in, um, to bring people of different sexual uh, orientations in. However, that means that we need to change the culture of the party enough that when they arrive, I think of it actually like throwing a kitchen party. You know, when you invite new people to a kitchen party and then they come and you're just hoping that your friends are gonna be nice to them and that everybody's gonna have a good time. We need to create that culture so that when, when people come in, we listen to them and we listen to their ideas and we actually change our practices because what we were hearing from the youth was that they wanted her there, but then no one listened to her at all. And in fact, she was yelled at. Um, she was asked to go campaigning uh, with older men who had never had a criminal record check and inappropriate things were said we simply cannot put people in that position. And so, you know, I was a day camp leader, like that, that's just not okay, I'm a mom. Um, so as a result of that, uh, different policies are being made in the central office around youth. Um, we need to make sure that those are made, that everybody knows about them, that the proper procedures are followed, and that when young people come, um, we really aim for that beautiful intergenerational skill transfer thing that can happen. Um, I've really benefited from that in uh, the climate change and health world. I love working with the medical students. They bring so much energy and what they, what they say, their kind of motto is we're too young to know what's impossible. So we do it anyway. And I find that that sense of possibility actually is what's gotten things done in that realm. Um, the Lancet Countdown on Climate Change was started by a med student. Um, the Global Climate and Health Alliance was started by a med student, the Eat Lancet Commission. Uh, was one of the founders of EAT was a medical student, they get things done. Um, and so our youth have the potential to, to bring that energy, the, those new ideas, that fresh take. And then when, when paired with the experience of people who, 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 who've done it before, who, who've done things before, who know how systems work, who understand how the political process works, it can just be the most gorgeous thing. And, and I have, I've done that work internationally and I, I, I see some of that already in the Green Party and I think we just need to identify those practices and scale them. Um, and then we need to listen to people like Amata who says that, you know, as a gender fluid person, she has faced a lot of really negative emotion. Um, and people like Anami who have said that she's faced a lot of racism within the party. And we need to make sure that uh, we honor those and you know, we do a lot of work on metacognition in the eMERGE. So we know that uh, when we make decisions, particularly when we make decisions quickly, we're, we don't always know exactly why we're making those decisions. So I will have a, I'm an experienced enough eMERGE doc now that I'll walk into a, a room and often have quite an accurate first impression of what someone has and why they're there. However, the, the disadvantage of that is that I can also be extremely wrong and I need to develop insight into what the uh, assumptions are in my head about why I'm, I'm uh, making a call, a diagnostic call on somebody so that I can stop and move to a different type of thinking, which involves going really systematically through all of the different elements. And all of that has to do with systemic bias. Um, and so it doesn't mean that anybody's a bad person, but we do come to, to every situation in our lives with sort of a, a history of all of the pre previous influences on us. And we don't always have, per well, I think it's impossible to have perfect insight into our approach to things, but we need to be continuously working on it. So cultural safety training, um, just making sure that when we, um, you know, get feedback, like what Anami and Amita have given us, uh, we really take it seriously. We honor that. We say, we hear you, you're right, and we're going to change. And all of that will make us the safe space that then when people come to our kitchen party, they're going to want to stay and hang out. Thank you, Dr. Hardy. Thank you very good, much. Good points. Uh, just, I want to be conscious of time. Uh, we have uh, Two more questions, one from Mike and one from David. Um, maybe, Mike, I'll give the floor to you first to ask your question. Great. Thanks, Matt. So I hope my internet holds out okay. Um, 
Dr. Howard, it's a question we spoke about before, but I thought I'd ask it for the benefit of others as, as, as well. Um, curious your position around MPs and the party um, and whether you would continue to allow for how you'd manage the balance between certain kind of boundary conditions uh, for example, MPs that might be not supportive of reproductive rights, how would you see maintaining those boundary conditions that all MPs are on the same page for certain um, policies, while also, I'll, I'll admit my bias, one of the reasons why I'm proud to have run as a Green is, uh, is that the party was very supportive of my putting our community ahead of the party, which meant that I could actually listen to our, our, our community and honor what I heard here and bring those voices to Ottawa first. Um, and so that policy around not having whipped while also managing some sort of a, a, a shared um, uh, priority across all M MPs, curious how you'd wanna go about um, approaching that as the uh, leader of the, of the uh, party. Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, certainly I, um, you know, I, I joined the Greens because I need to be able to, um, you know, vote in accordance with what my constituents uh, would believe is okay, as well as my conscience. But I accept also that, um, you know, that may put me a at odds with the party. So maybe that means that, um, you know, in certain conditions, it wouldn't be able to be part of the party and you might need to sit as an independent. Um, depending on where it is. I think that if it's a position that is like very clearly against stated Green Party policy, that's a different thing than if there's an emerging issue um, that comes up where the party hasn't necessarily discussed it, uh, where there, there's more gray area. I think that there is, um, you know, the ability to have conversations where when it comes to reproductive rights, I mean, when I joined this 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 race, I have a lot of, as you can imagine, uh, female medical friends, and they all ask me, "Well, where does the Green Party stand on abortion?" Every single one of them asked me that, and so that tells me that that whole conversation has colored the Green Party for a giant, giant, giant proportion of of Canada, and so. It, it's clear that on, on issues like that, um, you know, there, there would need to be, like if I was the leader and someone wanted to vote and I, I would have to, we would have to, I would initiate a process that would involve them sitting as an independent because that is simply not um, for the good of the party. And I think that there's issues like that where there's clear policy, um, there's really good reasons it has to do with human rights. Um, there's incredibly good evidence that, uh, for instance, having access to safe and healthy abortion and a full range of family planning options, uh, it's better for, for the health of, of women. And in fact, um, the countries that have the lowest rates of abortion are the ones where abortion is legal. And the countries with higher rates of abortions are where um, you know, it's illegal um, but it tends to go along with um, less uh, status of women in other ways as well. And so they can't access abortion, but they couldn't access preconception counseling either or, or birth control or, and or uh, expect any support after birth. And so the poor women are, are desperate and um, get abortions and then pass away. When I was a medical student at Vancouver General Hospital, there was a nurse, uh, one of the only nurses who, who still wore the little paper hat. And she told me that when she'd been a nursing student, there was an entire ward for uh, women who were sick and dying of septic abortion. And so this is real. And um, so issues like that, absolutely no way <laughs> would that be okay but you know if there are other issues um that uh, where there's less clear evidence less clear policy um you know i think that there there's a lot more room for for discussion thank you thanks dr howard um i want to be conscious of your time as well um uh, david's question might be the last one uh, he, he asked in the chat about proportional representation and if um, you stand behind that if it's an important part to improve our democracy and if so how would you um, how would you seek its implementation 
Yeah, so that um, you know has been shown to increase the uh, the the, the decision making in terms of health, in terms of environmental issues, um, and is certainly something that uh, I'm very glad that the Green Party supports. I think that in terms of uh, bringing that about, um, some of that has to do with with backing up to some of the conversations that we've talked about before in terms of making sure that we have the message, in terms of making sure that we're the party that um, is able to gather more power by being welcoming to more people. That's gonna help us win more seats and that's gonna help us bring uh, proportional representation about. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And Thanks to all the participants as well for um, joining us for this chat. Um, Could I quickly ask what form of proportional representation you would support, Courtney? Because there's what's called mixed member, there's pure proportional. Um, do you have a position? I don't really. Um, you know, I've lived in various provinces where different ones have gone through a, um, a uh, have been put to the vote. And I think that there's various approaches um, and they're all better than what we've got. <laughs> and so I think that um, in some cases, I, 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 to be honest, I'm sort of of a similar take on carbon pricing. We have a lot of arguments on the candidates uh, about which is better cap and trade or, or, or um, you know, a carbon tax. I've done a lot of work on carbon pricing. And the bottom line is that the one that is implementable is the best one. And so I would be very happy to have other conversations with other parties uh, in order to, you know, come to consensus and, and move forward. I think that we've had some trouble um, talking about pro proportional representation in terms of the communications, similar to, to what we've had with uh, climate change. And so I think that something that would be really worth looking into is how do we communicate it in a, in a way that makes more sense to people. Um, because I think sometimes it seemed needlessly complicated and we could probably explain it better. And hopefully without having to have a constitutional change. Yeah, good point. Thank you everyone for, for joining us tonight. I uh, appreciate the time. Um, there's a few important dates coming up. Um, we still have one more Q&A next week, and uh, we're hoping the, the week after that we'll be able to get all the candidates together for um, a discussion where multiple um, candidates can um, discuss with each other as well. Um, and then after that, uh, after the 23rd, which would be the debate um, uh, opening of the voting happens on September 26th until October 3rd. Stacey has uh, posted that in the chat. Um, uh, feel free to share this um, on, on YouTube with other people if they're interested in following along. And uh, maybe, Dr. Howard, I'll, I'll give you some uh, final remarks if you'd like. Sure. Well, I'm just very happy to have these conversations. I'm glad to have spent part of my pandemic uh, getting to know the, the Green Party members and having political discussions because my six and eight year old are not particularly excited about that. So thank you for spending some of your time with me for uh, bringing me into your community. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can do together. I think it's a, it's a hinge moment in human history. I think people are looking for a action oriented, sensible approach. And I think the Green Party is the party most likely to be able to bring it. So thank you so much for, you know, this energy, uh, for maintaining this community, convening that work, um, and it's super important work uh, to provide that solidarity and support for people as well as to create the structures we need to create change. So yeah, thank you very much and uh, sending, sending warm greetings from what is actually quite a beautiful um, fall day here in Yellowknife. It's still late there, it's starting to get dark here. Yeah, it start. Yeah, we're we're at the time of year where things change so fast. So, and you know, by the end of the month, it'll probably be dark at this time of day. And uh, that's a price you got to pay for the midnight sun, I guess. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Are you, you behind us? Uh, oh. What'd you okay, say to yourself? Take care. Not important. Okay. Uh, send me an email. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining. Good.